now have developed a monadic feature that allows you to get the speed of a few people without being concerned about the quality. There's a couple things that we are really excited to point out to all of you. We're going to demonstrate how we can do this in the platform in an agile way. I think it's a great way to get insights really quickly. Super excited to show um, our iHot offering today. Hello, hello, hello. My name is Avi Savar, and I am the president of Suzy. On behalf of everyone here at Suzy, I am thrilled to welcome you to today's webcast. Welcome to our customers, to our partners, and our prospects. We know your time is valuable, and we appreciate that you chose to spend it with us. In preparation for these opening remarks and this event today, I was doing a little bit of reflecting. And I don't know about you, but at least for me, the last two years have blended together into a big ball of mush. I've kind of forgotten when 2020 ended, when 2021 started, and now all of a sudden I feel like I blinked and it's pretty much 2022. And as we head into another new year, I've pretty much accepted that things will never really be the same again. I've been a lifelong entrepreneur, so I've always embraced change. But in my lifetime, I've never seen so much change in such a short period of time. It used to be every five to 10 years, something big would happen. And now it seems more like every five to seven weeks, something happens to change our behavior in one way or another, small or large. Up and down, this roller coaster ride we're on is just getting faster and windier. So the question is, as a brand, are you prepared for it? Who would you rather be getting on this roller coaster? The guy on the right, he's excited for the ride. He's got his hands in the air. He's ready to roll. The guy on the left, not so much. They're both strapped in, but one guy is excited for the opportunities the roller coaster ride brings. Maybe it's that Susie t-shirt that makes him feel a little safer. The other guy is scared for dear life. So who do you want to be? Navigating uncharted waters is a big part of the reason we built Susie putting the voice of the consumer at your fingertips so you can get, keep, and grow your customers with confidence so you can enjoy the roller coaster ride with a smile on your face. Suzy is the only Qualcomm platform with an integrated audience designed specifically for the enterprise. Our mission as a company is to enable human understanding. And over the last 24 months, that mission has never been more important. We want to help you develop products and services that delight consumers and create messaging that resonates and motivates them. But in order for that to happen, you need to understand human beings. And in this day and age, to be successful, you need to do it at the speed of culture. That's why we're here today. One of the most powerful things about Suzy is that the audience is integrated. I like to say the audience is baked into the cake. It gives the platform a huge edge it's why our speed is unbeatable. It's also why you can do things like retarget, save different audiences, integrate your typing tools, and much more. So today, we're gonna to spend a little bit more time focusing on this. We're gonna talk about segmentation, and we're gonna introduce you to a new offering from Suzy that takes segmentation to a whole new level. We call it dynamic segmentation because dynamic is what consumers are today. They move, they evolve, they change and they do it quickly. Traditionally, brands spend a ton of money to do segmentation studies. These are done every two years. That's right, I said years. We just don't think that's good enough anymore. If you look at how quickly things change today, not just based on news cycles, but also on changing demographics, we believe the way you do segmentation needs to evolve in order to meet consumers where they are today. And we're gonna show you how. In just a moment, Will Simarosa, our SVP of research, and Ali Wong, our senior operations manager, are gonna take the stage. And they're gonna start by breaking down the traditional segmentation process. And then our chief product officer, Nick Goshat, and our head of data science, Dan Ramirez, are gonna join the fun. They're gonna show you how using machine learning and our own proprietary solution, we're able to simplify and speed up the process while also making your segments more accurate and highly actionable. Then last, but certainly not least on the agenda, we're gonna welcome Michelle Esgar, 
who oversees marketing and brand experiences at Panasonic. She's going to join the stage for a customer spotlight session. Will and Michelle will talk through some learnings and provide some key takeaways from their work together using Suzy's new dynamic segmentation tool. So let's get into it. I don't want to take up any more of your time. To all of our customers, partners, and friends, as always, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your ongoing support, dedication, and your commitment. It's truly a privilege being on this particular roller coaster ride with you all. It's because of you that we're having such a blast. Take it away, Will, and take it away, Allie. Thank you, Avi. Uh, we are very excited to be sharing today our new segmentation solution. Um, I started here uh, about a year and three months ago, and we've been working on this project since day one. Uh, this is something that is probably the most sophisticated and, comp and complex solution that we've offered. Um, it's also one of the most important. And I've invited Ali Wong in here today to talk to us a little bit about the importance of, of segmentation, to take us through some of the pain points that we're all very much aware of and that we wanted to help solve. Um, and then we're gonna invite Dan Ramirez and Nick Shout in to take us through this new solution. But let's kick off and talk a little bit about the importance of segmentation um, and some of the pain points that we particularly have been trying to solve. And we always like to start by going back to the basics. We got to remind ourselves when we talk about any research methodology or any research tool, what it is that we're ultimately trying to do, right? And we are informing our businesses fundamentally how to get new consumers, how to keep them loyal, and how to grow our consumer base. Uh, segmentation has traditionally been a very powerful tool for market researchers in helping them do that. Um, it helps you identify your strategic targets, who it is that your brand should be going after to grow penetration, what types of messages and experiences are going to be relevant to those potential consumers. Same goes for keeping them. Why are your consumers using what they are? Who are they? And understand what drives those consumption, that consumption. And ultimately to grow, how to drive switching. Um, what are the unmet needs and opportunity spaces that you can innovate against to, to even grow your brand further? Um, these are very powerful tools, and they're also complicated. They're not the simplest things to execute. Ali and I have been working together on these types of projects. We just fielded one and debriefed one yesterday. <laughs> so, yeah. Ali, let's, uh, let's jump in and talk about some of the challenges that researchers face and how it is that we're going to go uh, and solve them. Yeah. So before we dig into the steps of segmentation and maybe some pain points that Susie's looking to address, I do want to say that I really love segmentation. I know Will loves it too. I think it's a great tool and I've done a bunch of them. I've been lucky enough to do um, a bunch of them. And uh, I know Will has done many more than I have, uh, but it's a great tool. And here at Susie, we're just looking to make it a little better and easier to use. So. Uh, diving into the process and the timing, uh, for those of you who have, who have run segmentation, you know that it can be a few months uh, from start to finish in terms of all the different steps you have to go through and all the alignment that you have to get along the way. Um, and we're going to go through these steps, but the, the general pain points I think of segmentation are that it's a complex process, it's very time consuming, and it's also very expensive to run. Um, and because of these barriers and pain points, uh, typically teams tend to refresh their segmentation every three to four years, which um, in today's day and age uh, might be a little bit too long between refreshes, especially with the pace in which the world has moved in the past two years with COVID. Um, so we're going to go through these different steps and maybe touch on some pain points and how Suzy uh, hopes to help address these moving forward. Let's jump in. So yeah. as we get into study design and you see all of these steps here, uh, it reminds me of when I was younger and I was actually about to start off on my first segmentation project. And my manager told me that these are one of those career moments. They're rare, but they're critically important because they have such a big impact. Uh, they have such a big impact because so many of your internal stakeholders are going to use them to help make decisions. And in order for them to be useful, the study design has to be aligned. You need to make sure that you've got the best possible inputs um, and the most relevant inputs to the market that you're looking to segment. Um, this can include things like brand list, brand attributes, the list of occasions, um, unmet needs, needs. These are the things that you need to go out and measure. Um, they can take quite a bit of time to get these collected. In fact, many times I've experienced studies that had to go back to qual just to find out what it was that needed to get into the study design. Um, this is something that is 
going to pretty much be a universal issue to ex experience. But let's go right into survey programming um, to talk about the complexity on that. Ali, tell us a little bit about yeah. getting these things actually built into surveys that can actually measure behavior. Yeah, one more thing about study design is that I think something I struggled with was also aligning on structure and um, how to structure the, these studies and surveys uh, because I had only done a few of them and they only come around every so often, as you we were saying. So I think at Suzy, we are looking at templated approaches and different frameworks that you can apply when, when looking at segmentations and looking to create studies for segmentations. Um, but jumping into survey programming, uh, if, if you've used Suzy, you know that survey programming is, is pretty painless compared to other uh, programs, other more traditional programs. Um, but yeah, survey programming in, in the traditional sense, uh, you normally are passing it off to a programmer who takes one to two weeks to get back to you. Uh, you are troubleshooting, you are link testing, you are trying to make sure that that survey is uh, perfect before it goes in because um, once it goes in, there's no turning back. So soft launching and you know all that stuff takes up time uh, in the process. Yep, this is not something that we feel uh, too concerned about bringing the platform. We've had lots of product launches designed specifically on, on making survey programming as seamless as possible. Um, same goes for yep. field work. Let's talk a little mm -hmm. bit about field work um, as, as a pain point. Remember, if there's ever a time that field management has been critical, it's during one of these studies. You are trying to segment a market. If your sample doesn't reflect that market in a accurate way, all of this effort is, is meaningless, right? With Suzy, we have got um, our own panel that allows us to set our, our field work management protocols to uh, an exact science that make, makes this much easier for us. Um, let's go to initial analysis, Ali. And yep. this, is, this, is the <laughs> this is definitely the thing that we've been spending a lot of time on because this is where the art mm -hmm. and science meet. And this is really one of those critical components. Yeah, and I think this is my favorite part of segmentation, it can also be pretty painful, um, depending on uh, what the different outputs look like. And I think this is the part of the analysis where you spend a lot of time tinkering, looking at different numbers of clusters for your solution. So, you know, three clusters, four clusters, are you going to force it to a five cluster solution? Uh, you're looking at where different attributes are landing and how they are and the varying importance to the different clusters. And you might move some things around. Uh, this is sort of where the art part comes in and you're using your judgment and you're also trying to get alignment from uh, your immediate stakeholders on what they're thinking. Um, so this is a fun part, but there's also some guesswork. And at Suzy, we're hoping to roll out the solution that takes out some of that guesswork. Uh, leaning on some machine learning enabled algorithms uh, to help you make the best decision. Uh, so whereas I was kind of just going off my gut and what some managers were saying to me and um, listening to some stakeholders about needs for the segmentation, uh, we've added an additional component uh, that uses machine learning to help you make the best decision. So yeah, we are removing as, as subjectivity and troubleshooting from this uh, analysis process. Um, to the point where <laughs> I couldn't be more excited. Like that's, this is one of the more exciting things that I've gotten to work on in my career. Let's talk a little bit about report generation, finding and finding workshops. Um, at the end of the day, all of this work isn't going to be of any value if your internal stakeholders can't leverage it, right? If, you, if your uh, end user doesn't understand the implications, what's the point, right? You need to be able to act on these things. Having a report that clearly outlines who your segments are and what the jobs are to be done to get keep and grow them is going to be critical to making the, your segmentation land. We have brought automation of report generation to a next level, and we're going to tell you a little bit about that more in a moment. But let's also talk about findings workshops and, and bringing this to life in a way that allows your end user to actually leverage this work. Ali and I just ran one of these yesterday, so this should be pretty fresh. Yeah. Uh... Love a good findings workshop. This is where you're using that report uh, where you've tried to really put the segments in the best light. You've developed personas. You have ideas about how uh, the organization should be using these. And you have a findings workshop to socialize, get buy-in from other teams and the larger organization about how your findings are going to be incorporated in all facets of research, hopefully, and also how 
to how to think about your business and think about how to run your business through the lens of these segments and clusters that you've just developed. Um, so again, really important, but also I think that if you've put in the work in those initial five steps, uh, this is uh, your your celebration, your, your moment to shine. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we had a good time yesterday. Um, it was a great findings workshop. But again, you really need to focus on those top, uh, those first five steps to make sure you're doing everything correctly. And if it goes well, uh, it's a really powerful tool for your organization to leverage and have. Yeah. So. And then 12 to 16 weeks later, <laughs> um, yep. you now need to make sure that you have what's called a typing tool, right? You need to be able to identify your segments for future research. This can be costly and time consuming as well. Um, and there's another element and uncomfortable truth that we've eliminated with, here at Suzy is that now that you've gone to all this work to have a segmentation, typically you now have to pay more just to do research to be able to type your, your respondents and to identify them for future research. Um, we deal with a lot of typing tools here at Suzy. Some are better than others. Um, we are very confident that ours is as streamlined and as smooth as anything that's out there today. And using our business model, you're not going to be paying on a research, you know, by uh, project by research project basis. Um, you type your panel and you have that ready to go. Um, Ali, yeah. thank you so much for taking us through uh, the process. Let's talk about now why this is going to be uh, continue to be so important today. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. So uh, obviously you have to refresh this every three to four years, which is a little scary when you think about the rate of change that's going on in the world today. Um, there's a tension that's developing here. We are very well aware of it, which is why we think that our new solution is so important for this time. That tension is that at the speed at which consumer behavior is changing and the rate at which market complexity is increasing, your ability to inform business decisions, specifically how to get, keep and grow your consumer is going to be compromised. If you're working off of a segmentation from four years ago, you are basically driving blind. Um, this is That's a pre-COVID like ancient history moment, right? We've developed this tool to make it not just easier, but for you to keep up with your consumer. Spending $200,000 every three to four years isn't going to work in this day and age. Here you can just see some screenshots of, of examples of studies that show challenges that are going on with inflation, right? With uh, supply shortages, you know, behavior changes in terms of COVID, social change. The census has come out, like just the very basis of, of your population has changed. The, this isn't going away. Right. The world is going to continue to become a more complex place and it's going to change faster and faster. That's why I am so excited that we have found a better way. And I, I really do believe that. Um, Alec, thank you so much for taking us through this. Yeah. We're now going to bring in uh, Dan Ramirez and Nick Kishow, who we have been working very closely uh, for the last year to get this uh, this new tool ready. Um, let's dive in. I'm really excited to have Dan Ramirez and Nick Oshop here today to take us through our segmentation solution. It really is our baby. Um, I know all of you have met Nick Oshop before. He's our chief Hello. product officer. Um, Dan is new to these presentations. Dan, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll jump into what makes our segmentation solution so special? Hey, yeah, absolutely. So um, I like to just kind of frame it as like, you know, I had a long career of, of measurement, right? Um, you know, working at, you know, some of the big big agencies working at Microsoft and Yahoo. M my goal was always to measure things um, and automate them, right? Make it make it make the humans go away, uh, make everyone's life easier. Welcome. So, talk to us a little bit about um, that approach that you've taken towards helping us develop this new segmentation module. Yeah. So everything we we've, we've kind of worked with the team to make things more dynamic, right? Uh, every you can activate things with ease, right? Um, we everything is statistically more accurate with our approach, and it's end to end, um, always on, always relevant. Um, you know, we 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 do the segmentation; it's there for you, and then it's also there in your in our, in our platform. Let's talk a little bit about four key components that's going to really make this different from what you're used to. The first, as Dan referenced, is our panel, right? We have a model where you pay by the question. We build you an audience of consumers beforehand so that you can very quickly target them and you can very quickly send them those surveys. Um, when Ali was taking us through some of the pain points around field work management, having a panel has made the cost and the complexity greatly uh, reduced. Um, we've really simplified what it's going to be like to go after an audience that reflects your market. 
We've also brought the powers of market research and cutting edge data scientists, data science together. Um, we looked at not just occasion-based segmentation, but different types of need states, psychographic profiles, um, occasions. We've looked at all of the things that you're going to need to understand and to be able to look at to help get, keep, and grow your consumers. Being able to take those needs and hand them off to Dan's team, where they applied some cutting edge data science, has really made this something that's new and different. Dan, could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So, um, when it comes to you know data science and, and, and we're, we're basically applying machine learning into the fold, which which is as I mentioned, it, it this makes it much more accurate, right? And we take the human out of the equation and let the model, the machine learning model, tell us which are the top factors what drives this particular segment, who are they, right? Um, and then that way, it's just, it's just easier to, to, to automate. I've been doing this a long time, and I had never been part of a process that, that like we just did for using this project uh, that's as precise and as, as simple to use as this one is. It's been really exciting. But at the end of the day, we've also got Nick as one of our internal clients, who is the chief product officer and king of driving us towards simplicity. Nick, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the simplicity that we've, we've overlaid on this? Sure. I mean, I think the main thing is just because we're doing things that are complicated um, doesn't mean our clients need to. Um, so really, you know, we are dedicated to relentless simplicity. Um, so, you know, what we've looked to achieve throughout this is to make sure that for everyone who's using the platform on a day to day basis, we're always a couple clicks away. Um, so all the work that they're doing is embedded um, into how I target, is embedded into different um, templates that I'm using to conduct research day to day. Um, but if it's not easy to use, we're not adding it to the platform. Yeah, we've 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 handled all the complexity specifically so you don't have to, and that's really what makes this so exciting. Let's talk about some of that complexity. Yes. Yeah, so this is at a high level, right? This is kind of the, the general process that we're, we're following that we develop uh, with product and, and engineering and, you know, and our researchers, right? Obviously everything begins with, with the Suzy audience. Um, and we run them through our, our segmentation templates, easy to use, easy to apply. Um, what we do then is, is then we, we, we add in the secret sauce, machine learning and various other statistical techniques to output the most optimal segments based upon who you're trying to talk to. Um, and our models, for the most part, um, can be replicated, you know, forward in time, right? But, you know, human beings are always a part of the mix. Um, you know, persona development is is always the next step, right? We, we look at the numbers, we look at statistics, and we work with you guys and the clients to develop those personas and make them come to life. And at the end of the day, it goes back up into our platform. Now, I would tell you that most people, uh, when they provide segmentation solutions to for, for their clients, stop halfway through, right? They stop in the middle and say, here you go. This is yours. I don't know what you're going to do with it. Execute it. Um, but we take it hand to hand. So what does that all mean? Uh, you know, <laughs> the buzzwords that we always hear, ooh, machine learning. Whoa. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's just math and it's 17th century math. Um, and we've just automated it all for you. Yeah. I mean, could you tell us a little bit um, about how much you really need to understand Bayesian statistics to be able to run these studies? Um, I'm going to say about zero. Uh, how much machine learning do you need to have to be able to run one of these studies? Um, zero. Nick, does that make you happy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, that's a that's a training module we will not have to look into. <laughs> Excellent. So you still do get the 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 traditional outputs, right? As Dan said, a lot of segmentations end with a segmentation dropped on your desk and a typing tool, right? The agency's delivered it. It's up to you to now socialize it. We have all of the things that you've come to expect. Our segments are distinct and recognizable. They're going to be of significant size. They're going to be highly actionable and statistically reproducible. We take report generation very seriously here, and we have developed what we would argue is a best-in-class summary of findings for you. Um, this is not something that we have shortchanged. With all of this automation and simplicity, we are not going to take away the depth of insight that we know that you need. All right. Um, <clears throat> we also take this a step further, as Dan says. 
right? We, we summar summarize the segment definitions. We break down the profiles by demographic, attitudinal differentiators, and key needs dates. We provide consumer target recommendations for supporting category drivers that are derived. And then we turn that into a opportunity matrix and a batch typing tool. We don't limit ourselves to just an occasion-based segmentation or a psychographic segmentation. We've taken the key components of a product experience regardless of what type of segmentation it is. And we've brought them together because we can do that now with that machine learning and with that simplicity of doing this in our own platform. Our survey is actually executed through a number of modules. The end user is experiencing three very specific types of surveys. Um, they start off with a category attitudes and occasions questionnaire uh, module. This is where we're looking at category attitudes, beliefs, usage occasions, need states, and usage frequency. When the consumer goes through that first module, which we've designed to be as simple, as in intuitive as possible, so it can't take them more than five minutes, they move to the next module, which is about functional and emotional benefits. This is where you find out what does your product need to do in terms of its importance, and how does it make you feel? Right, this is where we bring those attributes in before going to the third, which is about brand perceptions and performance. Well, how well does the brand that you use most often actually perform against those functional and emotional benefits? And what are some of the brand imagery perceptions that you have on those brands? A consumer is able to fill this out very simply and through three five minute modules. Right? That then goes through that segmentation module approach that we just we showed you. And then that's where the magic happens. It's not just a report. We take those drivers that matter and we turn them into easy to understand templates and we build them right into the platform. All right, should we take a look? Let's take this away. All right. Well, I am proud to say this is going to be our most simple and straightforward demo of all time. <laughs> so here I am, I'm uh, in the middle of creating my survey here. Um, this is actually something that we are working on internally. Um, and again, Dan, uh, where do I add my custom Python scripts? Um, don't worry about it. It's oh, all right. <laughs> it's under the hood. It's under the hood. Oh, okay. I just have to pick from uh, this drop down here. Okay, perfect. Oh, wait, uh, so I don't have to run the typing tool each time? I don't think you do. I mean, no. Just to drop that menu. No, just to drop, drop menu. that menu. Okay. I picked my drop down menu. Yeah, maybe I'll just key in here. Of course, I want to either select one or obviously, you know, the more that I can select, I can cut by that data and better understand how my different segments are responding. And then I go. And as simple as that is, that's a critical thing. You don't have to choose one segment or another. You can choose as many or as few of your final segments as you see fit for any one of your studies. You're not running that typing tool each time. Your consumers have already been classified under your segmentation, and you can access them just through a simple drop-down menu. All right, and then I'm going to uh, I'm going to fast forward a little bit here uh, into, let's say, the future, because um, we've actually ran this survey, um, and let's see what we got. So what we've run is our own internal segmentation of our panelists, right? And we are always trying to make their experience better we looked at a couple of reward options that would help with incentives. Um, our audience team, just like any other brand team, had a couple of quick questions that they needed to run by their segments. Here, you can actually see the results. We launched this study, <laughs> I got to say, around 10 a.m. We already have over 1,000 completes. And uh, Nick, could you take us how simple and quick it is to actually explore some of the results by segment? Yeah, so uh, let's look at it here. Let's jump into the specific results on this particular question. Uh, now, if I want to look into my advanced segment clusters, um, I can see all of that cut here. Um, and I guess, Will, could you just talk about the power of having this at your fingertips? Yeah, so the question came up this morning. Uh, I think it was 930 there was a couple of different reward incentives that they were exploring. They needed to look at it and check against our segments if this was still relevant to all of them. We uploaded our survey. That took about 15, 20 minutes. Um, you already demonstrated about how complicated it was to select who we were going to target. We dropped down the menu, we selected them, and we used that template. Our template library was just sitting there waiting to go. Our segments were ready to go. This was launched just before lunch. 
Um, it's early afternoon right now. We've got over a thousand results and we've got an answer. These respondents did not have to take a screening in typing tool survey. Um, we did not have to custom design this questionnaire each time because it was living in our template library. Um, what normally would be thousands of dollars and multiples of days was le legitimately a couple of hours. Great. And just to kind of tie everything together from where we started in Q1, um, when we talked about templates and the ability uh, to create um, custom workflows, um, can you just talk about the power of having custom templates in conjunction um, with targeting to these segments? Yeah, this is, this is um, a, an important thing to note, right? You've done all of this work to bring your segments to life, to understand what motivates them, how to get, keep, and grow them. And what we've done is we've taken the drivers that matter. We've used machine learning to understand what attributes across psychographics, across needs, across unmet needs, um, emotional, functional, and benefits that were most likely to drive satisfaction and interest in a brand. We were able to cor correlate that quite, quite set, uh, simply because we had Dan's um, advanced analytic tool there. We are now able to create templates against those drivers that matter. We're going to ask, how well does this meet that experience? How likely is this to make you feel like you are um, experiencing those attributes that matter? We can build the implications directly into templates so that you can target and ask those questions every single time. And what is my output from a traditional segmentation study? It's a PowerPoint and a typing tool. And a typing tool is an Excel spreadsheet with some macros built into it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Okay, cool. It sure is. Versus um, but, a, a, a set of templates and a course of research that can help inform um, my entire product rollout strategy over the course of an entire year. Yes. And, and you're being generous. So we're assuming that you're going to refresh this uh, once a year because of the cost and complexity reductions that we've done. But traditionally, you, this would be over the next four years. You've got a presentation that you have to socialize internally, and you've got a batch typing tool, which is a fancy Excel file that you have to use and pay extra for each time that you do research. We've taken your segments, built them right into the platform. We've taken the drivers that matter and turned them into research questions so that you can start asking consumers the right questions about the right topics right away. Dan, talk to us a little bit about the simplicity and the automation that we've, that we've brought in. Brought to life. I mean, yes. So the, I mean, the automation was a, was a labor of love, right? Uh, as you can see here, uh, this is Viral Palmar, one of my uh, data scientists, um, where we, we, we kind of designed it. We, we looked at, you know, everything that every scenario, every situation of what needs to be outputted and, and make it easy and, and simple to, really just run the just the, our van segmentation in a matter of of minutes and with a few clicks right um so it's it's fast and we, it, yeah it's it's basically fast it, it, it doesn't take too long um and you know like i said there's no need to for someone to look over the the data the the machine learning does all the work for us to to, to provide um uh, the, these segments output it with, you know, with models that can replicate it over and over again in our platform. Yeah, we've taken the study design aspect and the survey programming aspect of it, and we've turned it into simple approaches. We'll work directly with you to make sure that you're bringing in the right attributes um, and to make sure that you have the right range. But you, we don't have to worry about the complexity of programming. You do not have to do that. We have got that solved for you, and it's automated to the max. Um, we've actually had to blur this picture a little bit, much to my great disappointment, because it kind of loses the, the, the shine of a raw smile when we finally cracked this. Nick was worried that we were going to have one of those NFL moments where you saw our playbook too clearly, so it's a little blurred. But trust me, the strength of that smile is based on how good we feel about this automation process. Yep. Um, when we talk a little bit about the field work, initial analysis, and report generation, this is where even I myself have been like taken aback by what we've built. Like, I've, I've got a little bit of a tear in my eye. Right, because a lot of that art and assumption that Ali was just talking to us about earlier is gone. Um, we've got a k-means approach that divides that segmentation up into ways that allows you to quickly explore your different solutions. Um, 
with the benefit of our growing panel and our automated analysis, you can be looking at a final segment solution as little as three weeks, right? A report generation is just a click of a button away. Right. Let's do the approach. Um, we'll have your templates ready at the end of this. So that in just a matter of days, you can be in our panel selecting your segments and asking them the questions that matter. Right. We bring your segments into the actual uh, into the actual platform so that you don't have to wait and worry about your batch typing tool um, working or not working. Of course, we will provide one for you in as little as five days if you need to go off platform. But we have removed all of that um, out. Imagine being able to have a findings implication workshop where you can test ideas in the room with your stakeholders and start to launch those ideas against your segments right there. It's going to, to be a game changer for you to be able to access your segments in the moment as you see fit. Thank you, Nick and Dan, for sharing uh, more about Susie's latest and greatest. But don't take our word for it. Next up, I'm delighted to welcome Michelle Esker, Senior Group Manager, Marketing and Brand Experience at Panasonic, to discuss how she uses segmentation within her own work. Thank you, guys. So, Michelle, you're becoming a bit of a regular guest at our events, having joined us at our recent State of the Consumer Summit. Um, for those of you who don't know you just yet, could you please tell us a little bit about yourself and your work at Panasonic? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm currently the Senior Group Manager uh, for Marketing, Customer Experience, Brand Experience at Panasonic Consumer Electronics. Uh, and so Panasonic in case you haven't heard from us in a while, is actually about 96% B2B. And I am part of that tiny little, uh, you know, $500 million baby that is our consumer business. Not that little baby. Um, <laughs> we're, we're here today to talk about segmentation, uh, segmentation research. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how you've used that uh, type of research in the past? Yeah, so we've done segmentation research for a while, although uh, definitely we've seen some evolution over time, which I'm sure we're going to be talking about today. Uh, but essentially, we have a, a pretty wide range of audience that could potentially be interested in buying a product. And so we're trying to dig down and understand not just the demographics of who's buying the product, but really more psychographically, what sort of differentiates our audience than maybe from an audience for a competitor product or from one of our other products. And how do we sort of get a, a clearer picture uh, of who the right target is so that we can build some nice, accurate personas and, and start to kind of customize our messaging to appeal to them. Who are your typical uh, internal stakeholders for studies like this? So we have obviously internal insights and analytics. Uh, and then marketing, which is our primary. But I would say that that's starting to expand. We're, we're really showing the rest of the organization the importance of this kind of activity. And I think a lot of that has to do with um, online reviews, actually, more so than anything else. In the past, we would sell a product potentially through a big box store. And there was a certain amount of time before it got into a lot of people's hands and they would use it. And then maybe if they didn't like it, that that would start to filter back, right? But now what we're seeing is as soon as something becomes available, we're seeing reviews. Everyone in the world instantly knows what other people think of that product. And so uh, if you start to get customers who aren't the best fit, uh, that can really hurt you right off the bat. That can actually kill a product. And so I would say in the past, marketing was kind of an extension of sales, right? You had internal sales, you had external sales. We were external sales. Now I consider us more like matchmakers. So now it's how do we find the right person that's gonna actually be happy with this thing that we're selling and not just someone who's willing to buy it. Um, that's, it's interesting. We've been talking a lot about how there's more channels, there's more uh, for comms, there's more retail channels uh, and reviews is one of those new things that sounds like it's impacting your business. Are there other um, actual e-commerce or regular brick and mortar commerce sites that are impacting the way you work today as well? Yeah. Uh, in the same way that consumers have been kind of empowered and they have access to reviews, our channel partners are empowered as well. And so they don't necessarily need to take the product into the store right away. They can test the product online first and we can have to, we have to show our own demand first. And so uh, those same review impacts, we see that everywhere in the entire landscape. And so it's so important for us to really have an understanding of, of who's happy with the product, but then also it helps us to determine which are the right channels to go to in the first place. Where does that actual customer shop? Has that been uh, a changing landscape for you guys? Always. Yeah, always. And, and, and it really does help us to understand where, 
we may, you know, we, we may have been kind of going to one retailer over another just because historically that was the retailer that made sense for the category. But then as we're doing our research and we're learning about these customers, we can start to identify, you know what, there's actually a better fit for this customer. And now we're armed with some data that we can actually show that to the channel partner themselves. <sighs> That's a, it's a quick changing environment, isn't it? Um, what have been some of the uh, challenges that you've dealt with uh, in terms of socializing a segmentation internally in the past? I think that, first of all, I think that there's still a lot of people who don't understand the difference between a persona and a target uh, in advertising. And that's that's one of those hurdles that we all have to sort of work through. And really the best way to, to explain it is by using it. But with segmentation in particular, you know, if you do a segmentation and then you come up with a result that says, okay, our target is, and it's something really generically demographic, right? They're male and they are this income level and this educated, like we didn't need to do segmentation to do that, right? And so you're not proving it out. Where, where we found to be the most interesting thing and where we've made the most advances in how we use segmentation research is what we do after the segmentation. And so, uh, for example, what we did with Susie recently, as you know, is we created a typing tool from the segmentation that we ran, and then we utilized that to do our recruitment for our user testing. Uh, and this was actually really, really powerful because what we found in user testing was that of the three segments that we were testing, one of them preferred the product much more than the other two. And you never want people to not enjoy the product. Obviously, you never want to see that. However, in this case, it really validated the process and it gave me something to go back uh, to the broader organization to show this is the true value of what we can accomplish here because we've now identified a very clear difference between customers who are happy with the product and who are not. And I know how to identify them up front and I know how to talk to one group and, and specifically not talk to another group, right? Negative target, another group. And so I think that when you're able to do that and you're able to connect that, whether it's user testing or usability testing or whatever that next phase that you're going to do in your insights work, um, starting with that segmentation, now now you have a package and a process that's way more powerful. What else um, can you, now that you validate that, what else can you imagine uh, using this for? Like how else could it empower you to inform your uh, organization in terms of the way it makes decisions? Well, yeah. So once once you have that picture and you're coming back and you're connecting the dots and you're saying, OK, we have we have an audience identified. We know who's really happy with this product. We also know what's important to them, what they want to see next uh, in user testing. We know what features they're liking or not liking. And so now we can feed that back to engineering into our factory and start to work on the next iteration of product. Sometimes if it's a soft product, that might just be a matter of, of updating our user experience. Maybe we're updating our post purchase experience. So, you now have everyone from product planning to engineering to support, uh, leaning in and learning about what we're doing back in segmentation. It's a lot of internal stakeholders. Do you have any advice for researchers who need to be able to implement this type of work and actually make it actionable for their internal stakeholders? Well, I would say when you do this connected process and you you start up with your segmentation, but then you follow that up with some kind of testing and some kind of validation. Um, a lot of times we're moving so quickly on the marketing on the inside side that we just take that research and we use that and we start to define our marketing strategy. We don't necessarily take the time to brief in the broader organization. We don't necessarily take the time to show at the executive level, this is the process that we followed and this is what we learned here. Because what you'll find in those meetings, especially for people in your org who are not usually involved in those conversations, this is gonna be mind blowing for them right? To sit there and go, wow, you know, you were testing headphones, but you found out that people who really love sports are into the headphones and then people who don't love sport, like that's always really, really interesting and unique and it gets them excited. Uh, and then um, you'll find across the organization that prioritization and funding for insights starts to kind of move up as you share these stories. And so I would say, take that time to sit back when you have a real, what I would call a win, uh, which is where you uncovered really interesting insights or a nuance about an audience that you didn't expect, uh, or especially a difference between, you know, customer A who seems like a really good fit, but doesn't like the product in the end and customer B who also seemed like a good fit, but does like the product in the end. That's something that I think the broader organization will really appreciate. Yeah, we've, as we've developed the tool, one of the things that we thought was most important was finding attributes and components that we could put into our modules that would bring our segments more to life, right? And I, I know you've mentioned some of the media behaviors and, and uh, personal interests that help 
bring them to life, which can be useful for targeting uh, specifically um, in terms of like where to find them and what types of messages uh, to deploy. Um, yeah, it's, it's yeah, been, well, that's been an exciting you know, well, journey. That's, that's a, you know, that's a, a big, a big part. I think that when you do segmentation, it can be a little daunting up front, right? Especially designing a survey because it's this side, oh, what questions am I going to ask? And then you're always going to get pressure about, well, we don't ask too many. And then how much work are they going to have to go through? We don't want them to get too tired later on in the survey. And then, um, and, and I found honestly, Susie is great at, at helping you through that, but we tend to rush through that part because we're, we're, we finally let, you know, you got your funding approved that you're going to do the research, but you're still trying to plan out your marketing. There's a lot going on during that period of time. Um, but that survey development is so important because if you think about what your media plan is and what you're expecting to run, your targeting changes between the different tactics that you may do, whether you've, you're running an OTT or a CTV campaign, or you're running in Amazon advertising, AMS or DSP, um, Amazon lifestyle audiences are different than let's say how you're gonna target in Facebook. Um, and what are those key differentiating areas that you're actually going to be able to make use of in your media plan? Um, you have to put all that thought into it when you write this survey, because you don't wanna ask the same basic survey. I, I think a lot of times we get lazy and we have some basic survey we've written for headphones one time and then we take that and every time we're doing research we're like oh let's grab that as a starter and oh yeah there's that one thing we want to ask about we don't actually come back and start from the drawing board and say you know hey this is who we're thinking about this is where we're thinking of advertising and what are the things that would actually help us to differentiate once we have the data and so I would say you're going to learn anything with segmentation is do your due diligence ahead of time put a lot of time and thought into that survey development um, and really whoever you're working with your agency partner make sure that they're they're helping guide you through that as well and giving you more feedback on other things they've seen in your industry uh, that's going to be really helpful um, I think like well one of the most helpful things you provided us with was this list of um, hey we can tell after running our engine that these are like the five most important statements that you guys need to nail as a brand, or you're not going to be successful in this area, right? You need, people need to think you're an innovative brand when it comes to headphones. And that's something that we would not have come on on our own, right? If we hadn't spent that time. Yeah. The, the time that we spent uh, putting together the, all the attributes in that list across functional emotional benefits really did have a, a, a payout. Yeah, um, I was wondering if you could tell our audience a little bit about selecting your target uh, uh, segment, right? What are some of the things that you think about and consider? What are some of the different um, pros and cons that you weigh as making a decision on who to go after as a prime target? So I think obviously you, you've you got to get some numbers, right? You have to understand the size of your audience. So once you've run some segmentation, you're going to want to go back to whoever your agencies are, if you're using your internal analytics to get, to get an approximate size and say, okay, uh, based on my sales forecast and what I need to sell, there's some basic math here, right? You know, you're going to convert at roughly what percent, you know, you have the budget to serve however many impressions. Do I have a big enough group? Uh, that this makes sense? Or do I need to go back and return this data um, and, and find some ancillary groups that I can also add into that? Or maybe if my group is so big um, that I'm still going to be competing too much with my competitors, I'm not differentiating enough, then let's go back to the data and narrow that down. And so that's something that within segmentation, uh, when it's done this way dynamically, you can always go back and say, hey, you know what, this is what we're facing. Let's look at this data and re re smush it around a little bit more uh, and get us to an audience size that actually makes sense with our forecast. Yeah, I think the dynamic nature of that is one of the things um, that I've been most enjoying as we develop this new tool. A couple of weeks ago, we were just discussing like, how can we further expand on your audience? And it was literally just a matter of us going back and reapplying the factors, right? We were able to now look at where does that segment stretch out in, uh, into other ones to get more detail about who to go right. after and what are some other low hanging fruits? And that's not something when I was on the other side of the screen as a client, I was able to do what I always wished for. So it's 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 very rewarding to see someone to be able to do that. But that's oh, absolutely and definitely. I mean, like I said, you take we take that typing tool, we run that through user testing. If I come back in user testing and I start to see a pattern where our segments aren't quite lined up, right? So the results, I can come back, I can feed you that, and then you can return based on that information and see where we can find a common landing point. So um, I think the dynamic nature of the segmentation opens up a world of opportunity where it's not a one and done. Um, it also really, I have segmentation studies from the past that are, you know, two, 300 pages long. There's so much in there 
that it, it's almost, you know, it becomes really daunting just to digest. And then you're, you see positive things about a segment and negative things about a segment. Um, it's not all sort of oriented around like the key, the, you know, the real meat in the middle. Um, and that's, that becomes a lot more valuable when you can really just hone in and focus on those things and then gradually take away or add to as needed. Yeah, I guess the basics really are, who is it that I'm going after? What are the messages that I need to really be focusing on? Which channels, right? To, to, to narrow it down to, to those details. And there um, is still a challenge also because we we can do a really incredible job of, of personalized marketing these days, right? Especially with what's going on with programmatic and, and shared universal IDs and things like that, right? We can get very, very specific about who we're talking to and what message we're giving them and how we're positioning a product. And so we're literally serving you the perfect ad at the perfect time with the perfect messaging. However, everyone is still coming into a common product page um, and, and product information. And all of us on the other side of the fence are all working on content syndication, right? And, and uh, reducing all of the extra effort that goes into creating content for every single retailer. And so you could see there's a mismatch in goals here. On the one side, I'm trying to be so, so, so targeted. On the other side, I'm trying to be so, so, so general. And so that actually does impact which segments you end up pursuing because you do need these segments to have some kind of core alignment, some way of making messaging that's going to appropriately meet expectations expectations for everyone that you're driving in. Yeah, well, um, that we're running out of time, but that brings us back to like one of our final questions, right? It's a, it's a very quickly changing marketplace out there, um, both in terms of consumer behaviors and in terms of marketplace dynamics. Do you have any last words advice for market researchers as they uh, deal with this, this environment? Um, <laughs> I, well, know that I definitely... I, I definitely think, like I said, that bringing exposure to the large organization to what you're doing is is very important um, and prioritizing that research. I think I found now, whereas in the past we've had to beg for insights budget, now people are asking me, oh, are we going to need more insights? Like, what should we put away? Right. I'm, I'm seeing that prioritization from other groups, which is which is fantastic. And it's a really good good direction. Um, there's definitely a question around how how often do you have to refresh? How often do you need new personas? How often? And it does depend a lot on what you're selling and also on what the segment is that you came up with, right? So if you run all this research and you figured out that, hey, as long as my person hits an income level, they're in, we're in a good place, that's probably not going to change that often. But, you know, I have a persona for one of our categories that is striving parents. Well, today's striving parent is a millennial. But um, how soon before that striving parent really shifts into a Gen Z? And now it's a whole different, they've been brought up in a very different way. They have different media exposure, their experience, their values are very different. Uh, and so that persona is going to become outdated relatively quickly along with that life cycle or anything that is tech oriented, right? Everyone in the world is using an Alexa right now, but they're not necessarily doing that tomorrow. And so I think that you have to be super conscious and constantly go back and just check yourself and reconfirm. Also watching your, um, watching your media performance and seeing if you're starting to see a shift, if something's no longer working quite as well, um, it may be time to go back and redo your research. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons we're so passionate about making this tool as agile as possible. Um, but Michelle, thank you so much for your time. It's really been a pl pleasure chatting with you today. Um, you, everyone else, please stay tuned for the final, final part of today's program where Susie's team will be answering your questions directly. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. All right. Awesome. So let's look at this chat. Okay. From Timo, how do you secure that your initial Susie audience is representative of the market? Haven't Susie audiences typically been leaning more towards younger more more mobile savvy audiences. All right. Uh, I can oh, I can take this one. Um, yeah, I mean we we do have uh, mobile apps for iOS and Android, um, but we actually have pretty equal distribution uh, for web users versus mobile users. Um, so we do have pretty good distribution across um, different age ranges. Um, so. You know, that shouldn't really be a concern. Obviously, it's going to depend a little bit on the specific segment that you're targeting and the type of product might skew more to younger audiences or older audiences, et cetera. Um, but yeah, that hasn't really been a, a big concern. Yeah. And I would say when running segmentations, uh, we, we have a screener beforehand. So, you know, for, for a pet food company, you're going to want to segment uh you know, people who own pets. So again, we are we are screening our audiences before putting them into a segmentation. 
And um, the data science team is also looking at all the different demographics to make sure that, you know, our bases are covered and that we're getting uh, a good sample for you to segment your target audience. So we do keep an eye on that when running these. Um, and cool. I, I did want to just mention one thing. So there was a question. Uh, I, I know that my screen share was taking a moment to load. So I just want to cover off on that. Um, so in terms of targeting the segments, and it's incredibly easy. Um, basically, your your audience uh, search bar and, and drop down, um, you have the segments right in there. Um, and you can either um, target to the full segmentation and then cut your data on the back end. Um, or you can uh, target to specific segments. Um, but it's right where you create your action. Um, you'll see your uh, segment targeting right there. I'm going to see if you can hear me. Oh, yes. Ah, yes, we can. Oh. Will. <laughs> we can develop a, a segmentation module, but, but I seem to be struggling to get basic tech to work today. Sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> um, all right. Well, it's good to see you guys. Uh, thanks for starting without me. Sure. Um, we have another question from John S. that I think is going to be specific for Dan here. Um, is the machine learning an unsupervised model? Um, and what is the criterion for defining uh, or identifying a solution as optimal? So it's both. It's both unsupervised. The first half of the model is unsupervised. And then the second part of the model is supervised, where we, we know you know, we're now identifying the clusters and we're going inside a cluster and saying, which, what are the factors that are mutually exclusive for each of the clusters, right? Um, you know, that's entirely dependent upon the, the leaf that depth that we go, but we, we just tell it, say, give me the top five for each one of these segments. And, you know, the, the algorithm goes and selects them, uh, weighs them against each other, compares them against each other and say, these statements, signify your 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 millennial cluster or whatever it may be. This actually uh, flows into the next question from Jessica B. How have you validated this? And have you compared it to a more traditional segmentation? I would imagine you would hope to come to the same conclusion, but faster and cheaper. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, we have uh, done this uh, by, through more traditional uh, approaches to actually validate this. And that is exactly what we were hoping to come to the same conclusion. Um, we've validated this through a number of different ways and different approaches, um, doing it the old fashioned way, and then actually checking it against what the output was. Um, you saw in the video, some of the blurred vision, uh, of Viral writing out the code. We had a couple of different validation steps that we've gone through. Um, and yes, we did compare it and that's how we actually validate all of our, our, our tools is we actually use the traditional approaches. We manually check it and we check it over and over again until we're ready for a code commit. Mm -hmm. I, I guess, Will, do you want to just talk about the ways in which it's not just matching traditional methods, but in, in some ways it's more accurate based on your methodology and approach? Yeah, so I'd be happy to. And Dan, I'd love your support in this as well. I'm sure but, Dan has yeah, a lot. He, like, he yeah, yeah, there. yeah, go for it. Yeah, first crack and I'll, I'll pepper in some, some response out there. So uh, running factors and looking at different groupings, there is always a little bit of, I don't know, uh, art to it. They call it an art and a science, right? And moving different factors within different clusters uh, is, is a step that's usually required to get the segments to look like people that you would intuitively recognize. Um, we replaced that with a K-means classification tool, which I'll, I'll let Dan speak to a little bit more. But having done this manually and gone through that process, then that validation process, um, it was very surprising and rewarding to see how much more tight the fits were using that approach. Yeah, so I mean that's that's the first part of the model. It's the traditional part, but then the the machine learning this this starts to shrink and aggregate just the relevant information or relevant like factors per cluster, right? And that's where the machine learning element it is. And then the the final output is 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 a validation model that you know becomes the the basis for us to create a typing tool, right? Or create segmentation that we upload and, and you know score. On an ongoing basis, so it, it has a blend of like kind of traditional the the chunk and core, the middle of the process is machine learning, but the it has a blend of both. Um, we've got a couple from Gail R, who I suspect I might know. Um, let's break this into two ones. Ali, could you tell us about Susie and our ability to uh, screen using typing tools outside of those that were developed by Susie? Yeah, we can certainly do this. Uh, 
And the steps that we take is uh, just validating the typing tool once you send it over to us. Uh, we want to make sure that we have your audience on platform. Uh, we definitely don't want to take something that we're not comfortable executing. So the first step is making sure that we have the people that you want to talk to on our platform. Uh, and then after that, we'll also have our data science team uh, headed by the lovely Viral, who was pictured in that deck, uh, also look at the batch calculator or the algorithm to make sure that it's sound and that we can automate that on the back end. And once those two steps have been accomplished, and that typically takes you know three to five days for our team to vet, then we'll get started. Um, and end to end, I would say it takes three to four weeks for us to type your segments and get them into the platform. And then you can use uh, what Nick showed us of um, that targeting dropdown to just target the different segments of interest. So we can certainly do that. We do that for a lot of our clients and it's pretty cool. Yeah, and that goes back to Timo M's question, which I imagine I was having tech issues with, but it's basically two big main steps. We use a category screener to actually build the category audience um, to make sure that it's representative of your market. And then we deploy the typing tool from there. Um, once they've been uploaded into the platform, you have access to them um, as you, you know, whenever you would need to, just like any other audience. Um, Gail R asks, do your templates include a persona slash profile of all the segments on all the dimensions? Um, Dan, do you want to go first? Well, because there's there's more than one thing we deliver. We deliver a PowerPoint summary and then we deliver a data file. So, I mean, I think the question is all dimensions, whatever street, all the dimensions are all the statements and factors. So, you know, yes, right? So we give everything, but, you know, when we develop the, the kind of the actual model or the, our in house like typing tool, you know, we just shrink it down to the relevant um, questions or statements, right? Like the top five for each or top whatever. Yeah, so that's a part. Of, yeah, that's part of the the standard delivery. So you get everything, right? We we'll, we show our homework, or we show our work. Yeah, and the PowerPoint persona profiles are the highlights from the full data file. So you'll get your your segment um, across every dimension that was in the survey and all demographics, um, as well as all of the different um, you know metrics that go with that. Um, the PowerPoint is where we take the segment and turn it into a persona. We we pull out the storytelling components and put that into a, a, a shareable, you know, viewable file, but you'll always have that uh, that full data file for reference. I will say that reveal of the kind of breakdown of the different segments is pretty exciting. <laughs> um, you know, we mentioned earlier that we ran a segmentation of our own um, member base and, you know, it feels like you're getting the answers to a test or something. Um, just kind of all the things that you were trying to glean and understand are just, right there in front of you. And it just allows you to have this whole framework for all sorts of decision-making for your business. Yeah, and then I saw a previous question from Elizabeth. Are you asking survey questions to the same segments each time? Um, that's actually up to you. Um, your segments will be uploaded into your audience profile where you can select your different segments as you see fit. Um, and then it's just like using Suzy normally. If you wanna target back, and ask those same respondents a follow-up question, you can. Or if you want to target away and ask a fresh batch of respondents, you can. It's really up to you um, based on what your what your use case is. And you don't have to necessarily know that there's a significant difference between asking one segment or another. You can always just target by those segments and then let the data kind of tell that story on the back end. Yes. Um, so. This one's for uh, Dan and Nick. Ali and I had a nice chat about traditional segmentation models at the beginning of today's program. Hmm. I'd love to hear more about your experiences with segmentation models and how this has been different for you. Start with Dan. Oh, geez. Um, I think that the, all the, the convoluted ways in going about it and creating it has always been a challenge, right? And then the, you know, the art part of it has always been very difficult. Right? It's like, you know, very subjective. Um, but this way, we, we're kind of reducing the noise or eliminating the noise and just getting right to the meat of it and just truly identifying the segments and who they are. Like, that's something that, you know, that I don't see often, right? And I, it takes a long time, but we could do it relatively quickly, right, uh, on the fly. And others take months, quarters to, to actually execute. 
Yeah, I think, I mean, for me, you know, within the platform, the ability to um, target to other segments is something that we've had for a while. Um, internally, our ability to create our own segments is super exciting. And I think, you know, as has been the theme with a couple of the speakers today, the fact that we have added this capability in a time when the world is changing so much all at once. Um, we are somewhere in this COVID timeline and we are, um, you know, not, you know, just a, a couple months removed from a new census study that happens every 10 years. So if there would be an argument for, you know, either you could say on a, a hundred year pandemic schedule or a 10 year census schedule, this is the time when, I think everyone needs to really look at their consumers and better understand where they're at because the world is certainly a different place and changing fast. And I think, you know, you all have been working on this for over a year, but the urgency to really get something for our clients um, that they can use immediately um, was really based on the environment that we're living in. So it's for Ali. Can we export your typing tool to research outside of our platform? Ooh, let me let me unmute myself. Um, <laughs> yes, you can. So um, with our with the deliverable, it will have the different weights and the different uh, you know the batch calculator and the different things associated with the outputs of segmentation. So. Um, we, we pride ourselves on making a really nice typing tool. And um, I think the power actually of using us is actually having those uploaded into the Suzy platform. You know, you yeah. don't have to uh, rerun that typing tool every time you're running a survey um, because, and that, and that reduces fatigue, that reduces your costs. And um, we pride ourselves on also keeping those segments really fresh and be relevant on the Suzy platform. So um, while you can do it, I would definitely say uh, once everything is typed and ready to go on Suzy, it's to your advantage just with the speed and the cost to keep it on Suzy. Um, but yeah, we, we make a great typing tool um, and you'll get a nice Excel. Uh, with all the different outputs and things. Yeah, I see. I'm looking at Dan right now. Um, I'd rather keep it on. We, have, we have used yeah, a lot of other people's typing tools. And as people who've had to deploy them, Dan, tell us a little bit about that and what inspired you to uh, get us to our version of a typing tool. Yeah. So while, while working with you, you and Ali and Nick on this, it, it was really just kind of reducing down some of the uh, the mishmash of, of various types of typing tools uh, executions. Um, that you know they're they're very varied they ask questions in different ways if we could streamline the process of what are we asking them in a way that we could collect aggregate scale and automate right that's that's kind of what we're trying to get to and it gets you everything you need just in the basic couple of grid scale questions and maybe one or two multiple choice questions right and that's all we need that's all we need to kind of execute this and this makes it much more easier to kind of bring it to, together now i've seen ones who typing tools that come back from certain clients, well, this is great. I, this is, I, I give this a, a, a plus, right? And then there's others that, you know, or more of a headache, right? Uh, but, you know, with our typing tool, it's never going to be a headache. When you get it, you know, you'll see it, you'll, you'll understand it, the outputs. And if you want to take it off platform, you can, but, you know, it's probably best to keep it on platform. Yeah, I mean, you're you're looking at right now a team that's dealt with a lot of different typing tools uh, as we put them into our own platform and a lot of troubleshooting. And I know most of you out there from a research perspective have all at one point struggled with a, a typing tool that can be difficult to deploy, which is why we are particularly proud of the quality of ours. Even if we do export it out for other people to use, mm -hmm. um, we are quite proud of, of its predictiveness and its simplicity. Um, that's really what's key for us. Um, what are the compromises to be made with the segmentation approach versus traditional segmentation? Um, example, you mentioned five minute survey responses. Um, I don't really think that that's a compromise. I would say part of the challenge of dealing with uh, consumer research in this day and age is decreasing attention spans, right? So one of the, th I think that's just a compromise in general for trying to, to deploy a survey that can be complicated um, and you know drive fatigue. 
what we've done is we've really focused on the uh, action types or the question types that get the consumer into a groove. We like to use rank grid scales that are more intuitive for them to answer. Um, and we break it up into modules um, so that they're not getting fatigued. Um, Ali, do you have anything else that you would build about the way that we've um, developed this? And I want to also say that it's not yeah. that five minute survey, it's five minute modules that we target back to. Um, I think that having run traditional segmentations a lot in the past, uh, I've been very used to the art part of, you know, seeing the output in whatever program you're using and saying, oh, maybe this fits better in bucket two than bucket one, or, you know, maybe I'll just take that one out. It seems like it's not working. And um, I think as a researcher, some teams enjoy that. They really like getting down and dirty with that kind of art and flexibility piece. And with the, with our model, we tend to really just output it. We, we really trust that machine learning algorithm. So I think that's a difference that um, perhaps teams will have to get used to. And also realize that if you see the first output of this um, you know, segmentation and you're not pleased or have questions, there's ways that we can work with the model to make it fit your needs and make sure that you're pleased with the segments before we move forward with anything else. So we still yeah. are working with teams. Um, I, I would argue. Sure. Yeah, and, and so oh, go. Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> oh yeah, I was just saying that we still work with teams. I know that there's some automated solutions out there that are pretty uh, cut and dry. You know, they give you what they give you, and then that's kind of it. And um, you know, we, we've created this model to be flexible and we're, we're always improving it. So uh, as you work with us, we're going to work with you um, to try and still enable that flexibility while also adding the rigor of machine learning. Mm -hmm. So I think that's something that's just an adjustment. I wouldn't say it's a, it's a compromise or a drawback, just a difference. I think that's a really important point. And maybe Willer, Dan, you want to um, just uh, speak to that a little bit more, which is that you know, we will still work with you and go back and forth on what the result is. It's not a, just a push button and now you're getting, you know, here are your segments. Um, but where we're saving time and, you know, the, I guess, hard part of the art is to tweak the model or make a slight update is not going to take you now days or weeks of recalculating. It's just running the model again and, relatively instantly getting a slightly different results based on those conversations. I don't know if, if you all want to speak to that a little bit more. Yeah, I think that, um, yeah, this, it's, since we, you know, we kind of have the, the automation the process already kind of baked out, if like say, hey, I want to take this as use this as the Y variable or, or the independent variable, or I want this, I want to, I want to look at maybe multiple Y's or and then test against that. It, it's easy. It's just like, all right, going in and, you know, you know, setting it up and hitting run, well, not hitting run, but, you know, yeah. like return or whatever it is. And it pops out just as fast. Like there's no, there's no issue there. I think that, you know, in passing, like, you know, doing it the old way, that would take someone a week, right? And before machine learning, you know, people, you know, it took them even longer, right? To do this type of analysis. Yeah, and the benefit of that also is if you want to see, let's for example, a three segment solution, a four segment solution, a five segment solution, we'll show you that. We're going to make a recommendation based on what's the best fit. Um, and then the other thing is if you if you really do want to spend more time in there with the data, the speed at which that can be calculated gives you more time to actually go in and explore your segments um, once they've been uploaded into the platform. Yeah, I think that that's a really great point because what it is, it's like you, you don't get bogged down in the minutia of the the data that all the insights are kind of bubbled up to the top and you you have less time going like doing a deep dive in the data when you don't really always have to and, and sometimes you don't have the time well um that's really all the time we have for questions today um thank you all for joining our uh final product event for this year stay tuned for suzy product updates webinars and thought leadership pieces in 2022 thanks again and see you all soon thank you I